Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie. This will be my Dragon Ball superhero movie review. I was able to go to the US premiere. There's a lot of deep cuts and references to all the major Dragon Ball series going back to the first one and to the previous movie, Dragon Ball Broly. So I will explain where this movie fits in the timeline. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. It's been a while since I've done an anime video. I think the last one I did was for Attack on Titan season four a while ago and then the Dragon Ball Broly movie way before that. It's been about four years since that movie came out. That's how long it's been. Don't you feel old now? Technically, the movie is called Dragon Ball Super Super Hero, but you can call it Dragon Ball Super Hero too if you want to. It is meant to be part of the canon timeline, the main series. It's meant to take place after the events of Dragon Ball Broly, but not that much time has passed after Dragon Ball Broly. And really like the most notable thing that everyone's probably going to be talking about, aside from all the big power upgrades that everyone gets, that's usually what everybody talks about. But the other major technical aspect of the film that people will be talking about mostly will be the animation style. The animation style for this movie is a huge change. It's more 3D computer animation and CG as opposed to the Broly movie where they did use some CG for sure for the fights, but Broly was animated in a more classical 2D hand-drawn style. Like it was meant to look more like the old school Dragon Ball series. This time the entire movie is 3D CG animation. It didn't take me out of the movie or anything like that. Their implementation of it is getting a little bit better. Like people are actually getting better at incorporating it into the series. So if they wind up using it for whatever the Dragon Ball Super sequel series winds up being, hopefully they'll have gotten a little bit better by then. But it was a little bit weird to go from watching Dragon Ball Broly to this 3D animation style. Like it was a seismic shift. I do kind of wonder if they were using that as a test run for this animation style for the Dragon Ball Super sequel series. They will be doing another regular Dragon Ball Super sequel TV series in the next couple years or so, the next year or two. I don't know what the exact premiere date is going to be or exactly what the plot is going to be or if they're going to be changing a bunch of stuff for the manga. But there will be like a next Dragon Ball series that will take place later in the timeline and incorporate all the stuff that's happened to the characters so far. The second big thing about the movie is that it's more of a Gohan and Piccolo movie than anything else. Like if you felt like Gohan and Piccolo got the short end of the stick the last several years in the Dragon Ball Super series with the character development, then this movie is like the answer to that. Like they both get huge power upgrades. And when I say it's mostly a Gohan and Piccolo movie, it's mostly one of those types of movies where like all the regular mains that you would normally see be the leads in movies get sidelined for the entire plot so that the quote unquote other guys, so to speak, like the backup team basically has to handle all the main villains. So there were a couple contrivances like how come Goku isn't here? Like where's Vegeta? What's going on with Broly? Like they do explain that during the movie, but they're very on the nose with the way that they sort of sideline them so that it has to be a Piccolo and Gohan adventure. Pan is also a big part of the plot if you felt like she hasn't gotten a whole lot of character development the last several years. There are tons of references to the major arcs going all the way back to the original Dragon Ball series when Goku was a child. Like they try to go back to the beginning of Dragon Ball with some of the original arcs to reference what's happening with the villains in present day to sort of tie things together across all the series, including Dragon Ball Z. We're kind of in that era of Dragon Ball where there's been so much Dragon Ball in order to keep the older stuff relevant. They try to incorporate it in the plot and make it meaningful for the plot of the newer stuff, which I do think is kind of cool. It's kind of like being a Star Wars fan or like a Marvel fan or a DC fan where like new movies include Easter eggs for like really old classic stuff. And if you haven't watched those old Dragon Ball series in a billion years or you never watched them or you just forgot about a lot of those arcs and that plot, they include a very, a very long recap of a bunch of different characters and arcs to explain what's going on with the villains in the movie. The main villains of the film are mostly Magenta and the Red Ribbon Army, which is a big deep cut to the classic Dragon Ball series. It's been so long since I watched that original Dragon Ball series, I definitely needed the recap for the Red Ribbon Army stuff. The other really big deep cut is bringing back Cell. They do a huge recap of the Cell arc from Dragon Ball Z and bring him back as Cell Max. He becomes the real big bad of the movie. The new characters they introduce are Dr. Hito, the grandson of Dr. Jiro, the person who created Android 17 and Android 18, and then eventually the original Cell during Dragon Ball Z. So like at the beginning of the movie, a portion of the big recap was for the Cell arc so that you remembered all that relevance. In the movie, Jiro's grandson has become a scientist as well, who's kind of morally ambiguous, gets himself thrown in prison, but isn't totally evil, who also loves creating the perfect android. And he's the person who winds up creating these two new characters here, both androids, Gamma 1 and Gamma 2. Like I mentioned earlier, Goku, Vegeta, Broly, and Broly's new squad from the Broly movie are all in the movie, briefly though, like very briefly. 
They're really in the movie just for continuity's sake, like what's happening with the main characters since the events of Dragon Ball Broly. Like I said, because it's mostly a Gohan Piccolo movie, they had to create a reason to keep Goku, Vegeta, and Broly off-world the entire time because they're way too powerful right now, so they just had to find a way to take them out of the story, basically. So because of that big plot shift, like because this is kind of a movie about the side characters, technically, I mean, Gohan and Piccolo are main characters, but they're kind of treated like side characters now. Because it was just about them, and it had so many really obscure deep cuts to classic arcs, really it felt like a smaller movie than Dragon Ball Broly. Like it wasn't quite as epic a story as Dragon Ball Broly was. Just because so much of Broly's story goes into the mythology, the origin of the Saiyans, the origin of all the main characters, the origin of the Frieza Force, Dragon Ball Super Superhero didn't go quite that deep. Like it was mostly a side quest to power up a couple neglected characters from the Dragon Ball Super series. But it was still very entertaining. Like if you're a big fan of Gohan's character and you have been really upset that they kind of sidelined him for so long and Piccolo as well because Piccolo is supposed to be pretty powerful anyway. They do really shine during the movie. They give them some huge power upgrades. But if you haven't seen the movie yet, just do be prepared for it to feel like a much smaller story. But one of the great things is them paying off a lot of those deep cuts. Like if you remember way back to when they introduced the prophecy about how Gohan was supposed to surpass both Goku and Vegeta as like the most powerful member of their race. But then Dragon Ball Super kind of decided they weren't going to deal with it. Like, you know what, we're just going to come back to this at some point in the future. We need to focus on developing this new Ultra Instinct stuff right now. We're mostly focusing on Ultra Instinct right now and introducing the Broly character, who himself is also supposed to be really, really powerful. It was satisfying to see them finally pay off all those bits of mythology about Gohan's power levels and at the same time give Piccolo the massive power upgrade that he's been due for a while. Piccolo's new highest form they're just calling Orange Piccolo, when he said it out loud in the movie it got a big laugh in my theater. Gohan's new highest form is being called Gohan Beast. I think that's just meant to be a clever wink at their race, turning into beasts, so to speak, under the light of the moon and becoming way more powerful. But it's not like he turns into an actual beast, it's sort of like his version of an Ultra Instinct form. But I think because during the movie, Piccolo very literally talks about him being the most powerful Saiyan, like being way more powerful than Goku, and Goku has gone Ultra Instinct, I think they're trying to say that Gohan's Gohan Beast form is also now more powerful than Ultra Instinct. I am sure when they get to whatever that next Dragon Ball Super sequel series is, they'll find a way to keep Gohan from going straight to Gohan Beast in all his fights. It's the same with Goku and Vegeta going Ultra Instinct. Like they try to keep the power levels kind of under control, so they try to make it seem like it's a super rare form that they take, like they can't hold it for that long. The music was pretty good. If you like the music in Dragon Ball Broly, the music in this movie was fairly similar. Even though I definitely needed some of that recap for some of the super deep cuts, I did like all the references and easter eggs they tried to include. If you've been a fan of the series for a long time, like if you're a super fan of Dragon Ball, then you'll probably recognize way more stuff than I did. And because this movie felt kind of like a side quest to power up a lot of the neglected characters, I wouldn't be surprised if they do this with future movies as well, just because there's so many new characters that they keep introducing to the team. The level of fan service in the movie was about on par with normal Dragon Ball movies. Like there was a little bit of fan service and because there are so many long running tropes like the Dragon Balls themselves or like Shenron, they included the obligatory jokes about some of those long running things. Like at this point, the actual Dragon Balls are kind of used so often, they're like party favors. So there are a lot of jokes about characters misusing their wishes on trivial things. And they give Shenron a big power upgrade too. So like Shenron himself also becomes more powerful during the movie. So I believe he's permanently now at his new power level, but no big spoilers about what that power level is. There is a post credit scene, so make sure you watch after the credits, whether you're watching in the theater or you wait to watch it at home. So it's more like a funny joke kind of post credit scene, but they do pay off like a really, really long running reference. Once you do have a chance to see the movie, just post all your reactions in the comments below. And when that new Dragon Ball Super sequel series starts in the next couple years, I will try to do at least a couple videos for it, but I have no idea what the plot of that's going to be yet or when it's going to start. Only that they will eventually do it. One of the few things that you can count on in this life is that they will continue making new Dragon Ball till the end of time. And even though Avatar The Last Airbender isn't technically anime, it's like Western animation inspired by anime, they did confirm that they're making three new Avatar The Last Airbender films. The first one is going to be with older versions of the character after the events of the book three finale. Of course, I'll do videos for that when it releases. Mike and Brian are also making a new animated Avatar The Last Airbender TV series. Of course, I'll do weekly videos for that too. I also believe that the Avatar The Last Airbender Netflix series, which is live action, will premiere next year. Good or bad, whatever that winds up being, I'll do at least one or two videos for that. We'll see how that live action avatar goes. We're all kind of crossing our fingers and hoping that it's not terrible. 
Big reminder too, my Marvel She-Hulk episodes will start next week. You can click here for my brand new She-Hulk Daredevil trailer video and click here for my Ant-Man 3 trailer video from Comic-Con and Avengers 5 Kang Dynasty. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.